guys, I'm Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more. So in today's video we're taking a break from study content because I've been asked by so many of you over Instagram DM to make a video about my Oxford English interview experience. Now to be honest I've been putting off this video for the longest time because I just didn't really want this channel to be about me because my goal here is to help you guys become awesome lit learners by equipping you with all the necessary skills and knowledge. But since Oxford interviews continue to be a frequently requested topic, I figured that I'll just do a quick one on my three top tips for a successful Oxford English interview, at least based on my experience of having gotten in. A big disclaimer here, I cannot promise that you will get in off the back of my sharing, but hopefully these tips give you a good idea of what to expect if you're going for it. So for most people, the Oxford interview would be a week-long boarding experience. So obviously this was pre-pandemic back in my time, so online interviews weren't really the norm back then, and most people wouldn't really want to miss the opportunity to visit Oxford anyway. Well, I certainly didn't. So I applied to New College, and as expected, I was interviewed by all three of the English tutors there. But what I didn't expect was also being pulled to another college for an additional set of interviews, which apparently happens to some candidates, but definitely isn't the norm. So I got pulled to University College and I ended up being interviewed by two of the English tutors there, and there were actually really prominent tenured English professors there. So this means I had five interviews in total, so you can imagine how knackered I was towards the end of the experience. I was also slightly freaked out because I didn't really know what the pooling implied. It could have gone both ways um, and I kept hearing contradictory messages from the people around me. Was I pulled because I wasn't good enough and the new college tutors didn't want me? <laughs> or was I pulled because of sampling reasons which had nothing to do with my performance? Now to this day I have no idea, but know that this happened to me and I eventually got in. So if it ends up happening to you as well, don't take it as an ill omen of any sort. Okay, so let's get on to my three top tips. So my first top tip is to read widely and diversely. So if you're considering an English degree, then chances are you are already an avid reader. But there's the risk of leaning too much to one type of author, one historical period, or one literary style. For instance, you could have read every modernist poem under the sun, but not have touched a single Victorian brick of a novel. And I don't blame you for that. But this may be problematic because the interviewers are English professors with specific areas of interest, so a Dickens academic interviewing you may want to chat about Victorian things, and if you've not at least read some Dickens or even just Victorian prose in general, then you could be left out in the cold, and we don't want that to happen. And if it's difficult to read something cover to cover, which is often the case for really thick and long Victorian novels, then maybe just try sampling a few poems from each major literary era, so that you at least have a broad awareness of the different writing styles and the key themes across different literary periods. So here's a list that I've compiled that I think you can refer to, with some short texts that I recommend you could explore in preparation for the interview. In two of my interviews I was asked to analyse texts on the spot, so it was basically an impromptu unseen text exercise. One of the texts was Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem I Wake and Feel the Fell of Dark Not Day, and the other excerpt was the opening to Dickens' novel Bleak House. So no source was given for either texts, and I was asked by both interviewers to guess the author and literary period of the passages. Embarrassingly, I got the Dickens one wrong and said it felt like something George Orwell would have written, which shows that I, um, well, hadn't read enough Dickens back then. And for the Hopkins poem, I guessed that it was by a romantic poet because of its references to nature and God. So to this, the interviewer was kind enough to say, you're wrong, without actually saying those words. <laughs> but um, he ended up being my old English and medieval tutor for three years. So I guess no harm, no foul in the grand scheme of things. But the big takeaway from this is to read as widely and diversely as you can. 
but also not to worry too much about necessarily getting the right answer because right answers are actually not what your interviewers are after. And besides, the study of literature isn't ever really about finding the right answers anyway. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. tip is to make sure that you know every text and author mentioned in your personal statement because your tutors will call you out on it. So if you sneaked in a comment about how Wolf's to the Lighthouse made you bore your eyes out then please for the love of God make sure you've actually read the book and that you remember stuff about it. Ideally you'd be very familiar with the author's texts and ideas you've mentioned in your statement because the tutors will most likely ask you specific and even brain teasing questions about them. So back when I was an overseller 17 year old who thought that anything with the prefix meta was cool, I went through this phase of blind fascination with American postmodernism. And it was blind because I didn't actually understand 99% of what was going on in the so-called POMO texts. All I knew was that it sounded cool, it seemed cool, and so if I thought they were cool, I was cool as well. Evidently not. So when one of my interviewers asked, hmm, so Jennifer, what do you mean by a paradigm shift from modernism to postmodernism? I didn't actually know what to say. So all I could do was fumble with a bunch of incoherent words. So the only thing I think that saved me was um, probably my um, undeniable charm. Of course, in hindsight, I see that what I wrote doesn't really make sense. And to learned eyes, it reflected a shallow understanding of the terms modernism and postmodernism. Because first, postmodernism was a largely American movement, whereas modernism was a much more transatlantic movement with different strains of development in Britain, America and continental Europe. Also, postmodernism came much later than modernism. So postmodernism only came into prominence circa 1960s to 70s, while the last modernism was at its height in the early 20th century pre-World War II. So long story short there wasn't in fact any shift between these two fundamentally separate concepts but oh well this was actually the same old English tutor who gave me the Hopkins text and ended up being my professor for three years so go figure. So my final tip is to think about literature from non-literary angles. How is literature similar to maths? Why could studying economics benefit our understanding of literary texts? How is a poem similar to an equation or a painting? And how have advancements in science contributed to developments in literature? So it's important to adopt an interdisciplinary mindset when considering literary works because we know that nothing is ever written in a social vacuum and that behind every poem, novel and play there's always some cultural or historical event as inspiration. So I remember that quite a few of my interview questions were interdisciplinary. For instance, I was asked if I would ever consider Darwin's On the Origins of Species to be a work of literature and why or why not. And another one I got was what are the qualities that make maths beautiful and how are these qualities applicable to our appreciation of literature? But the one that took me by surprise was if I'd ever consider the nutritional info on a cereal packet to be literature and why. I distinctly remember saying that we could read the nutritional info table as concrete poetry, which is the type of poetry presented in a specific shape. I don't know how the interviewer took that, but um, you know, again, eventually, I got in. So in any case, the key to answering these questions is to show open-mindedness and creative thinking. So instead of taking the origins of species question literally and say, no, it's non-fiction and therefore shouldn't be considered as a literary work, it'd be much better for us to think about how and why non-fiction scientific writing could carry just as much literary and aesthetic weight as say, a novel like Hard Times. So to wrap up, here is my bonus tip, and in my opinion, the most important one. 
relax, smile, and be friendly. Ultimately, tutors want intelligent students, yes, but they also want likeable students whom they can work with on a weekly basis for the next three years. And if you're truly passionate about the subject, they will see it. So as much as the nerves will inevitably kick in at that point, try your best to focus on enjoying the process. Remember, these interviewers are not looking for any right answers from you, nor do they have a perfect candidate in mind. So if you're good enough, you're good enough. Trust in that and trust in you. And if you want a list of Oxford English interview questions that I've put together, then make sure you sign up to my mailing list, link in the description box below. Otherwise, I hope this was helpful. And if you're watching this, having done an interview at Oxford, then please share your experience with the others by commenting down below. As always, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification so you never miss a useful English Lit Study video from me. And I'll see you guys very soon. Bye.